Yes. Uh, Congressman Green, thank you for taking my question. Um, you know, something that you mentioned during this press conference was the Black Lives Matter movement. And something that the proponents of Black Lives Matter talk about often is the criminal justice system, issues of mass incarceration, and so forth. And so I'm wondering, like, to what extent have your experiences touring this DC jail and seeing what conditions are like inside prisons, um, you know, to what extent has that made you reflect on the criminal justice system writ large in this country and the potential for reform that people who are opposite you on the political spectrum often call for? Um, well, looking at looking in the jail, I reported we put the full tour in there. So there's a lot of detail about every single part of the jail. Now, here's what I can say about criminal justice reform. I do not think it's good for anyone in prison to be have to read Nation of Islam newspapers and that be one of the only publications they have or, or information or curriculum that informs them because of the color of their skin, this is why they're being treated this way. I don't think that is good to rehabilitate anyone. I think in prisons and jail, we should rehabilitate people, and that has to do with job skills, education, and, and building character so that when they leave there, they're able to have, have a really good second chance. And those are the things I believe in and I would like to work on. As far as the difference in the jail, though, it's very clear. The January 6th defendants, they were not allowed to participate in any of the continuing education curriculums that we were shown that other inmates and other pretrial defendants are allowed to participate in. The January 6th defendants are not allowed to participate in job training like the other inmates and defendants are allowed to participate in. The January 6th defendants are not allowed to participate in mock trials that there was a third-year loss. Uh, law school student there helping other inmates learn how to handle the courtroom and what to do. None of those things were offered for the January 6th def defendants. They were isolated in a separate wing of the jail where they are abused, where they are ridiculed, where they are mocked because of their political beliefs and because of January 6th and because of the color of their skin. So there is a two-tier justice system, and these are the things that need to end. I believe in criminal justice reform, but I believe it should be reform that's fair across, completely across political lines and skin color. And I can tell you what we saw in the D.C. jail. None of that exists. Yes, ma'am. Um, so Democrats are forced to use January 6th throughout the midterms um, on their messaging point. Uh, is this an issue you think Republicans can mobilize around next year as well? I think that every Republican voter and I think many Americans, independents and, and Democrats that I've spoken to and have asked me questions, they care about January 6th because they see the clear hypocrisy. You see, here's the problem with a lot of political consultants and people running for office. They forget that people aren't stupid. As a matter of fact, American people are really smart, and they're able to see when they're being lied to, such as when there's big political biases in the press. They're able to see when a, a, on a campaign ad on the television that, oh, yeah, you want to show me the riot at the Capitol over and over again? Well, I remember the riots that went on and on in 2020, and they can drive down the road in their city and still see the burnt-down car dealerships or stores and remember all the looting that took place and the police officers that were attacked. So I don't think this is about campaigns. I think this is about real events and what happened uh, to the American people here in our country. Yes, sir. Uh, one question for you and one question for uh, Judge uh, The D.C. Circuit uh, is for you. The D.C. Circuit already ruled that most uh, January 6th defendants should be released. Uh, but those who, quote, actually assaulted police officers, broke through windows, doors, and barricades, and those who aided, conspired with, planned, or coordinated such actions are in a different category of dangerousness than those who cheered on the violence or entered the Capitol after others cleared uh, the way. Uh, most defendants uh, who are facing charges from January 6th have been released. Why are you, are you choosing to single out these defendants who, who multiple courts have already found are in a different category of dangerousness uh, as uh, people who should, be, who should be released and who are being uh, treated unfairly uh, when you, know, you say they shouldn't be detained at all, but uh, 
the judges have found differently. Isn't your beef with them? I think there's a big political bias playing in the the courts here in Washington, D.C., especially with the public defenders. The January 6th defendants that I spoke to and asked questions to in the jail said that they, if they have a public defender, they said their public defenders hate them. And they're being represented because they're poor and they can't afford to pay a lawyer, and they're being represented by public defenders that call them white supremacists, tell them they have to denounce President Trump, tell them they have to denounce their political views, want them to watch videos and read books that basically is critical race theory training in order for them to have this public defender represent them. You see, that's a political bias in the court. Let me, excuse me, let me go further. I am, I'm not involved in anyone's cases here, and I'm not defending any of the actions that happened at the Capitol, nor will I, because I, as I said before, I didn't like it, and I don't agree with it. I objected to electoral college votes, but I wasn't a part of the riot and, and was shocked when it happened. But what I will tell you is the treatment of these people is absolutely wrong. And I spoke to people in the jail there that were not charged with violent crimes that walked through the Capitol. So when you see when you see people being held indefinitely and they've been held in solitary confinement 22, 23 hours a day, um, being held in a, in a prison cell where their bathroom, their toilet doesn't doesn't work and they have to hold it for more than 20 hours in order for them to wait to be able to use a toilet when they're let out. When they're being force fed gluten food and they have celiac disease and so the food that they eat makes them sick every single day to the point where they will go without days, go days, I'm sorry, days without eating in order to just feel better because they they are not given better food. I think we can clearly see that there is serious abuse happening here and we can go beyond the silly dilly uh, political games. I think we need to break down to the facts and I'll hand it over to Congressman Gomer. Yeah, and let me address that too. Uh, with regard to the uh, treatment of the inmates, uh, I think it's very clear to those of to, to Marjorie and and me that what the courts have gotten is not accurate, and it will not be until some federal judge forces Speaker Pelosi and the Capitol Police to release every hour of video that we will have an accurate picture about who did what because uh, they haven't gotten it so far. And we know that from some of the lectures that some of the judges have provided. Now, look, I was known as a law and order judge and chief justice, and I believe in punishing people for their wrongdoing, and there was wrongdoing on that day. But the more, the further along we go, the more we find out federal government involvement may have actually brought about people carrying what they now call deadly weapons. And we now see Epps and John Sullivan, who has been released long since, out there trying to stir people up and, and getting them provoked. Uh, we need to get to the bottom of whose conduct was more egregious. And if it was people within our own Justice Department that were creating this situation or helping create it, are luring people that had no original idea of going as far as things went, then those people need to be punished too. And let me say this too, because we, we've been accused of, of saying, oh, you're, you're out to help the whites. I didn't know what skin color everybody in the D.C. jail had until I got there. But uh, other inmates were telling me the most verbally abused person in there happens to be black that he has caught more flack than any of the white defendants. And it shouldn't matter about skin color. And to those that are doing the treating, it is really outrageous. Uh, people need to be fired. They need to be in some other area of employment rather than um, being in charge of people that they can abuse. Yes, ma'am. I just want to ask I'm sorry. Look, you, 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 somebody else. Let everybody ask one what, before you get back to your second. What's session. your question? Sir, you've made some pretty serious accusations. Are you saying that you have reason to believe that on surveillance video captured in this building on January 6th, there is evidence 
that federal agents staged or provoked <laughs> the events of that day? Are you saying and, that is what will be found on And the that question indicates either a dishonesty on your part or a lack of integrity because there is film out there publicly that shows Epps, Sullivan, other people who are participating. There is video we are not being allowed to see. When I was visiting with the inmates, a very few of them had been given discovery and it was lists of video. And they were saying, look, see this video, this is where it depicted this and and they skip one two three segments and different ones were pointing out that's the segment where this was shown this was shown and that's what they're cutting out some judge is going to have to get serious and release everything uh, so that we can all make that determination because what we've seen so far as more and more comes out uh, raises important issues that cannot be resolved until we get all the film. And if you have not seen federal uh, hand in some of this, then you're not paying attention. Yes, ma'am. Congressman, do we have a estimate uh, right now of how many detainees are still in the D.C. jails right now? The latest, isn't it between 40 it's and 50? somewhere between 40 and 50. Um, but I would like to talk about what I saw on video footage when I was in the jail. I was shown video of Roseanne Boylan dying, and I talked to the man who is a January 6th defendant, and he's the one that gave her CPR, and I saw the video of that, and then I also saw the video of her being drugged down the hallway, her lifeless body, and her shirt coming up and exposing her breast. That's on the video. The story of what happened to Roseanne Boylan and her family deserves to know, that's all on that video. That video should be released. There's a lot of video that should be released. But I think if you want to write about what happened, somebody needs to, somebody needs to demand that the video for Roseanne Boylan be released. And these questions you're raising used to be asked of people in government, people that had the video, that had the people that could verify, testify, but even more than that, the video. Those are the questions that need to be asked of them. Why are you not allowing all the video to be shown? And uh, uh, it sounds like to me that there's Andrew. some people that don't have a problem with the way people are mistreated. I want to follow up on something uh, Congressman Gates said. Um, he said if, uh, when the Republicans take, if the Republicans take back the House, quote, it won't be the days of Paul Ryan and Trey Gowdy and no real oversight. It's going to be the days of Jim Jordan and Marjorie Taylor Greene. Can you expound a little bit on what the days of Jim Jordan and Marjorie Taylor Greene are going to look like? Yeah, we're going to send subpoenas. We're going to conduct real oversight. We're going to show up in person and get answers. The notion that Republicans are going to take control of the House and we're going to hold hands in the warm spring rain with the Democrats and legislate is ludicrous. We have to make promises to our voters to get answers to these questions that we hear in our towns and in our communities. And when we get the power back, that ought to be our organizing principle. And this document that Congresswoman Green and Mr. Gro and Congressman Gohmert led in preparing ought to be a guidepost in that effort. Can I just and it, that real quick? Yeah, sure. Do you envision, uh, you know, you guys have talked a lot about do you envision retaliation for members of the January 6th committee? for Republicans who have broken with the party, whether on impeachment or... Impeachment. Well, at this rate, I don't know that too many members of the January 6th committee are going to be back, but we'll see. Uh, in, uh, yes, sir. If you do retake the House, would you want uh, ex-President Trump uh, to be the Speaker? I would. Have you talked to him about it? I have. And what did he say? Oh, I keep my conversations with the former president uh, between the two of us. Yes? Today, or Ms. Green, what about the treatment of... The Capitol Police officers on that day. I mean, I was down here that day, not too far from here. We saw police officers who had been bear sprayed in their eyes and were blinded by mm -hmm. many of these January 6th defendants that you are now uh, drawing attention to. So I don't remember you holding a press conference about the treatment or the unusually cruel treatment of Capitol Police officers. Uh, you may not remember a particular press conference about police officers, but I have made many public statements and cried out against all violence against police officers for the BLM. Yes, for yes, for the police, specifically Capitol Police, 
here. Congressman Gomert sponsored a bill that I co-sponsored along with him, wanting to give, uh, you know, medals of honor, wanted to award them for how they were treated during the January 6th riot, but also extend it to police officers all across the country. I'm not going to separate them. I, I am very supportive of our, of our police, and I have consistently denounced the violence here. So do not go down that route. That would be completely unwarranted. I think another thing that we need to talk about is the January 6th committee, their unconstitutional um, bounds that they are completely crossing, wanting to get records of telecommunication from telecommunications companies, bank records of people so they can continue to politically um, do this warfare that they're waging on Republicans, but yet they're unwilling to go to the D.C. jail. They're unwilling to, to release videotapes. They're unwilling to talk about the real things that happened that day. They just want to extend it to keep on attacking Trump, keep on attacking President Trump, because they're so filled with Trump derangement syndrome, and they need something to cover up the fact that Joe Biden's administration and the failures of the Democrats are destroying our country right now. So I think the best thing that the January 6th committee should do is they should take a tour of the D.C. jail and they should go look at the conditions that are happening there and then, you know, talk to more police officers, talk to talk to people, witnesses that were there that day and release all the video. Because if we release all the video, then there's no speculation or guessing. It's all there for everyone to see. And that's how this nation can heal when we are able to look at the truth. And let me just let me respond to that as well. I've made clear that when it comes to anyone who did violence mm -hmm. on a Capitol Police or any law enforcement here, mm -hmm. that I would have no problem sentencing them and I would sentence them to incarceration. Mm -hmm. That is serious. But when somebody is in pretrial confinement, it's very important we don't confuse punishment that comes after conviction with pretrial confinement where the jailers get to make their own pronouncements of guilt and then carry out punishment. If we are going to have an orderly society, you betcha, I believe in punishing people who assault members of law enforcement. I have, I will, I've sent people to prison for long periods of time, but if we confuse the pretrial detention with post-trial punishment, then our system is hopelessly lost. And that's why we're raising candidates. We are here because we want to salvage the system. Yes, ma'am. Were any of you in touch with any of these defendants prior to January 6th or anyone who's currently being detained? I've been in touch with no defendants. No. I, I haven't either. Didn't know any of them. Uh, and I, I've gotten letters from different ones. Yeah. Thank you all so you much. No, let me be clear. When I said I'd gotten letters, that was after detention. I'm not aware of any contact with anybody that participated in January 6th and committed offenses. But it does raise a, a, the issue of an offense. I didn't know in June of 2016 that it was a felony crime, but for many of the January 6th inmates, uh, they've been charged with obstructing an official session of Congress for four to six hours. And if we're going to have a fair system, then most of the Democratic Party in the House that was there in 2016 need to be charged with the same thing. They obstructed an official session of Congress for 26 hours. Thank you all very much. Congressman, one more question. 